very warm welcome to the show, Lindsay, on the Spirit Guides Network Radio. It's lovely to have you on to discuss your workshops and a bit about yourself as well. I know many people know you as the Binet Woman um, from the uh, 70s TV series, but I guess not many people um, may know that you do the, the spiritual work as well. Um, and, you know, obviously you've got a lot of people coming to your workshops I hope that we can raise awareness to people who don't know um, are you finding that there's quite a lot of people that are aware of what you're doing in the UK? We've had yeah we've had some uh, wonderful response um, uh, typically I, I limit the numbers on, on certain ones of the workshops on the intensives and so we've been pretty pretty well full with the way we've said it most of the time and we're kind of working on new formats now that can accommodate more people. They're just shorter form, three hours in an evening sometimes. And, um, you know, we're kind of always morphing it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Because sort of looking back at the, you know, the, the Binet Woman and doing some research on, on you, I was under the impression, like most people, that um, people start off in the film industry um, and then as they mature a bit later on, they get more spiritual through life experience. But from yourself, it seemed that you was already quite spiritual before you went into that, and you sort of added that to your role. Yes, actually, that was that's a lovely summary. <laughs> <laughs> when people talk about that, I always find myself, how can I say that? I say, can I call you the next time I need, I need somebody <laughs> to explain it? You said it so succinctly, but then that's what you do for a living, isn't it? <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, yes. Yes, it, it's been really a lifetime journey for me, uh, always in... Uh, even as a kid, in a strange way, I was I was uh, fascinated and wanted to go to church and was saying, when are we going to go to church with my parents? And they're going, what's wrong with this kid? You know, most kids, you have to drag them. <laughs> and, uh, and then when I was, uh, well, as you probably read, when, when I was 19, 19 and 20, I had an illness, I had some ulcers. And, and it was through meditation, visualization, fasting, this, that some people, a doctor and a minister both, who are very holistic in nature, took me through a process and of physical healing and, and self-investigation. And I was just blown away with the fact that I was able to avoid surgery by doing that and, and doing the processes that they, that they kind of took me through for about six weeks to two months. And it just changed my, well, I should say it changed my whole view, it changed my whole conditioned view. I think my intuitive view of the world was a lot more spiritual as a child, but the conditioning oftentimes is not. And uh, so that just kind of blew all of conventions out of water for me, and it began a lifetime study. And so I've studied Eastern, Western, you know, naturopathic, homeopathic, herbal, I've studied with the Tibetans and Native American shamans and... uh, Hindu, some Hindu ways, and just so many different things as well, of course, uh, never to me was it a contradiction to my own Christian spiritual journey, so I um, did a lot of meditation and just all kinds of stuff. I just had an avid appetite for that, yeah. especially after that experience at 20. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, did you actually overlay that in your role? Um, some of the research you did that you was able right. to almost um, yeah. pressurize the producers to make it more deeper. Exactly. Um, we, we did various shows that had a different consciousness than you would ordinarily see in what would be considered an action show. Uh, we did, for example, uh, an episode called Biofeedback in which uh, the... Uh, the character that we were talking about that in that particular show had gone to uh, Tibet. He was part of the OSI, the science research team. He'd gone to the OSI and studied Tibetan monks and uh, learned to control his bodily functions by his mind and was able to slow down his heart. And when he got shot, he was able to stop the bleeding by controlling his mind, as the yogis and the, the Tibetans have amazing things that they can do with it. And we all have that potential. You know, that's a, that is our human potential. But um, we tend to want to fix things from the outside all the time here in the West. Mm. <laughs> and we forget how much power there is on the inside. So we did a story like that, which was very unorthodox in, in the midst of, uh, of an action show. But fortunately, our show was uh, kind of science fiction slash reality. So we had the ability to do that show and nobody thought a thing of it. So you could either 
believe that that was real, or you could say I have science fiction anyway. So, um, and we talked about, uh, you know, back then in the 70s in, in the U.S., it was just the beginning of when the, the our culture as a whole was starting to address the issue of the Native American Holocaust, if you will, that went on in our country. And uh, in the 70s, it was the first time a country that was based on religious freedom when the uh, Native Americans were actually finally legally given the right to practice their religion, certain parts of their religion, which had been taken away from them uh, at one point. And so we did a we did a uh, an episode uh, with uh, Charlie Hill, who was a Native American comedian at the time, but also an actor, and. Uh, the story was written about his, uh, he was a scientist, but he had connection with his ancestors, and, and he would hear, and, and his ancestors were trying to connect with him from, uh, you know, from the other side, if you will. Uh, so we did a story about that, and lots of, lots of different things, as well as, as uh, just looking at, in as many episodes as possible, the so-called bad guy as not someone other than another human being who had his own opinion and maybe was going about it in some un, mm, some unacceptable ways of getting, you know, we have spies that, I mean, they had they were spies trying to do something with us, but we were spies, you know, and doing that. So it's like, let's not make it so black and white, you know, so right and wrong. So let, let, let's look at, in trying to do conflict resolution in some of these stories, as many as you can, um, at least show the, ad, the so-called adversary as a human being. Because I think when we stop doing that, that's when we don't do conflict resolution and we just simply do conquering, you know, and just wipe them out if they don't agree with us or do it our way. Because we don't see them as human beings with their own agendas and they have a right to that in some way, you know? So that's what, a lot of what we did. Sure. So does this kind of lead on to, I mean, in your own life, you was helping... Um, is it convicted? What are they? People that, uh, that harm their wives. Oh um, uh, yes, uh, domestic violence offenders. Domestic <laughs> violence. So you're kind of helping those to sort of break that cycle, which is right. kind of like trying to help the bad guy in a way. Change <laughs> the. <laughs> That's your word, not mine. <laughs> That's a lot of people's words. It was my word when I was growing up because uh, my family struggled with that issue, and he certainly was the bad guy. And as I grew up and did my own healing and. You know, I realize that all family members can heal, uh, those who want to, and, and uh, far more people, far more um, uh, people who commit domestic violence, and women do it too, um, really would like to change their ways and not, don't understand how or why they're trapped in this, this syndrome. Mm. Uh, uh, so it, it really takes some, some compassion on, on the part of the people who may be offering help to someone who has... Because we, we see everything as the, the victim and the oppressor, and, the, and we see the victim as always innocent. And but you, if you've got kids, or if you remember being a kid and you have siblings, you know how many times your younger brother would do something, taunt you, and then you'd get mad and you'd yell, or you'd, you'd punch him, and then mom would come in, you'd get in trouble. But then you never saw what the kid did. Right? Mm. Not that anybody deserves to be hit. Not that, you know, not that, it, it, it's just, it's just a dynamic that everybody needs to look at how, it's a very big subject, and I, and I don't suppose we should get very deeply into that subject here tonight, um, but, but it is a pattern that everyone participates in. And so, at least in, in America, we tend to only reach out to the victims and, and, uh, of that, in that syndrome and not to the person who's, who's doing the offense, and yet the physical offense. But, but what happens by doing that, you never learn about the dynamics that are going on in the family that could, need to be changed. Because even if, if someone who, who tends to use violence as, as the, uh, uh, to, to stop whatever is going on, I mean, it's not just random. There's something that they're trying to affect, trying to stop. And so, so 